Welcome everyone to Three Questions, where I ask my guests to choose three questions out of five, and then uh, we talk about stuff. Um, I am really excited today to be joined by Naval Karuni. Uh, oh my gosh, I'm going to get overwhelmed. Naval is an educator, a writer, a professor, a parent, an incredible community member, a friend. Um, one of the things that I love about Naval that I love about you, Naval, is that uh, in my experience with you, everything you do in all of those areas, teaching, writing, parenting, community building, really comes from your heart. And uh, I know that sounds so whatever. To me, it sounds sort of cheesy. Like you have the intellect to back that up, which is really nice. Like you've got the chops. But uh, I really appreciate the way that um, your teaching, your parenting, your connections come from a really true and genuine place of deep feeling. Um, and it has been an honor to watch your career, uh, both in your teaching and the care that you gave to the eighth graders you served in Brooklyn. Uh, to the love and care that you've put into your book, Nourishing Caregiver, Caregiver Connection, Colla Nourishing Caregiver Collaborations, which is an incredibly <laughs> beautiful book, uh, so needed in the field, to all of the love that you give the people in your life. So um, I'm very, very grateful that you agreed to talk with me today. How's it going, Paul? <laughs> intro. I can't. What? Um, this is supposed to be about you and your incredible work and your exciting upcoming love coming into the world. I'm just, thank you for having me. That's this. Yes. See, I'm doing my job. Naval reminded me to go get this before this conversation started. Yes, the book is coming out soon. <laughs> but really, this is just an excuse to talk to people at the end of the day. So, Well, thank you for inviting me. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> So, Naval, uh, you chose uh, questions one, four, and five. Um, I think it's going to be a little bit of a surprise what those questions are. I'm going to read them to you now. And so we're going to get a fresh, a fresh take here. Ready? Okay, question one. This is a pretty easy one. What is your educator origin story? And how would you characterize your current work? Let's start with origin story. Okay, so I think... Maybe some people know that I used to be a newspaper reporter before I was a teacher, maybe, no. and that I went into journalism because I love to write, talk to people, but more than that, I wanted to do social good. And when I was a reporter, I realized that it was just a whole bunch of reporting on what was happening and saying what was happening, um, as opposed to making actual yeah. change. Now that I've been in education for yeah. a long time, I know that education is a lot of that also, saying the things that we want to do, but not really making action, uh, not really making change, but saying that we're going to lean into things or that we want to grow towards things, but not really doing the work. Um, but that's well, we're how I listen. <laughs> right. So that's how I made my transition is saying I actually wanted to change the lives of the people who I was serving. And so I transitioned to education through New York City Teaching Fellows, um, became a classroom teacher, moved to Chicago for my husband's work, was a classroom teacher there, um, moved into literacy coaching, moved into then district work and professional development and leading professional development um, in the city at a bunch of different schools. Um, and then it led me during the COVID pandemic to doing research on families when there was all this funding for Chicago public schools, uh, you know, COVID relief money. They wanted it to be a program that wasn't a one-off program, but more of a cohesive, what ended up being collective care model. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the book and the research. And so that's the work that I'm currently doing mostly. Um, in LA and Chicago, a little bit in Jersey City, and then teaching at NYU. It's not bad. So I want to slow it down though, a little bit because there's two points that I'm interested in from your story. Like one is like that moment when you were a journalist and you're like, this isn't it. Do you know what I mean? And what was it about teaching? Like, because you could have done a lot of things to enhance the social good, right? So what was it about education? And I ask that selfishly a little bit because... Um, I was in theater before I became a teacher and I had a similar oh, right. sort of journey where I was like, this isn't doing what I, this isn't building the life I wanted it to build for me. Like I felt like I loved theater. I loved doing it, but I felt like um, 
at that time with the people I was around, I'm not damning the entire profession, but I felt like it was a lot of people talking about themselves and their art and their looks and clothes and auditions and this and classes. And I felt like I wanted more of a, of a, of an impact, right. Where I wasn't just talking about myself all the time. I am fully capable of that without a career helping me do it. Um, (laughs) so what was it for you? I know it was, you wanted to have an impact, but why teaching? I don't know. I, I think probably it was the social, it was the social work component of working with kids and families that I really wanted. I distinctly remember my co-teacher in Brooklyn saying, you really could have done social work as well, (laughs) because I think it was just, it it wasn't about the education. It was more about, I wanted to work with kids and families. The other piece is that I was reporting really horrific stories in Newark, New Jersey. I was a beat reporter. So I was writing about all the ways that families perish and children perish. Like I was writing on the other extreme and I was, I was experiencing people's pain and I did a really good job of having families open up because it was all heart. It was all really deep listening. It was all, um, I don't want to say code switching. It was like putting, it was like, you know, I don't do small talk. It was like getting to the heart of the matter. So I was a really good street reporter and that's what really good teaching is too, right? Like really good teaching. So I don't know that I'm answering your question, but a lot of journalism like served me in education. Um, And I don't feel that it was like a wild shift. It it was the stuff that I loved about journalism. I love about education. Um, but I really wanted to do something other than just like report the news that then got placed in the garbage can. Yeah. Um, you know, there was something yep. like very yeah. ephemeral about that. And it felt so wrong to report a whole person's life on the front page of a, a newspaper and then throw it in the garbage yeah. the next day. That's like all the family got about their kid, you know. Um, and I just wanted to do it such justice. I remember all of these quotes from family members and all these terrible moments I was, I was the best at getting those because they would send me to these like horrific, we had the police blotters, you know, this? have I told you these stories, we would get there before the police. Um, so there were like these crime scenes. I mean, it was just like truly terrible. Um, and those, I wanted, I wanted the same kind of like heartfelt, this is a whole person's life. And I feel that, and I bring that to the work that I do with families now, you know, that like unapologetic positive regard for whatever it is that the families are experiencing and how does that help us better educate and serve the child? Um, you know, so it's a meandering. Do you feel like that's the same? It feels like it's the same. No, it's not at all. And I feel like it's the same sort of, I wonder with the, cause the second thing I was going to slow down and ask you was about sort of how you shifted your focus to families but it sounds like it's the same. It's all part of the same mix for you in a way, but that's sort of what brought you to teaching in the first place was the idea of the family and supporting families and doing things to help families. It's true. You know, what's very cool is that I always knew in my heart that families were doing the most of the educating, um, that, you know, educating didn't happen within school walls solely. (laughs) I knew that, but it's very cool to see that my research has proven that. (laughs) Um, and that like the cultural pedagogy and the like, you know, four mothers that we are built, that I'm like building this work around, you know, this, it's true. The funds of knowledge have always existed. Um, families and communities have wide ranging literacies that we may or may not validate in our school systems and wrong on us for not validating them and exalting them. I'm just really excited that like my center of gravity is now focused on families it doesn't mean that I like can't do and strengthen literacy work. We're doing the same work. It's just like my center of gravity is a little bit shifted to mm-hmm. professional learning for teachers and school districts around how to exalt family connection in everything that we do daily, weekly, monthly in the literacy classroom. So it's so beautiful and so brilliant because I think like I mean so much of it's terrifying, right, in a way to think that family are the real educators, right? Or it's terrifying to me as a parent. It's not terrifying to me for other parents, but for me, I'm like, oh no. <laughs> but like for so many kids, for so much of the time, family is what matters as much, if not way more, than 
school, right? And the, even though you're spending more time in the school building and all that. And I think about it with um, the book that I'm putting out there because there's an angle of it or there's a thread through the book that's really looking at like, how do we keep, like, yes, it's about reading, but it's also just about humanity, right? Yes, it's about character motivation, but it's also about being able to look at your own motivations and be like, what am I motivated by? What are the people around me motivated by? How are those in tension with each other, right? That like when you're a good reader, you're also enacting in a kind of like therapeutic journey because <laughs> you're encountering other people in other families, doing things, struggling, growing, all that. Um, and I think the idea, it's just, it's just taken too long and I'm glad it's you who's sort of more overtly hooked the work we do in our classrooms, especially literacy classrooms, to the home. Thank you. It's I going to go I better, right? If it's connected. If I, you know, if I think about like how you have impacted my work, it, it, you, your classroom coaching always was centered on the authentic. So it was never an isolated mm -hmm. schooled literacy. It was making the connection to the kids right. that was going to serve them outside of classroom walls. Um, and it's the same, you know, it's, it's exactly the same. I think a lot about how our kids show up um, in spaces outside, like in the recess room, you know, in recess, in, in the cafeteria, in their spiritual communities, how they are in the order of their siblings, um, what their family makeup is, who their chosen family are. And how that then helps inform our way of connecting with them when it comes to character motivation or when it comes to problem solving or when it comes to conflict resolution, even in our most dysfunctional families or at family dynamics, yeah. because I get this a lot, it, there is learning happening. There is learning, there's identifying, there's like a connection. <laughs> there's, that's a right. there's, there's, there's empathy building. There's um, a lot of lessons in the dysfunction. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you've always been good at naming that. You've always been good at making that connection, like the child who can give a wide, you know, it was from you that I learned that, you know, uh, the child who can analyze the slope of their like grandmother's back or the, you know, their cat, you know, connection, that child can analyze text in that exact same way, um, you know, can analyze. So the expansive definition of literacy also is a way that we can connect with kids in authentic ways, as opposed to just schooled literacies. Seriously. Well, and right now, right, with all the new curriculums coming out and the way that teaching is changing and, you know, I, I feel like I used to fight to just get good work in books going and now I'm just fighting for books, just books, just for kids to read a book. Like, I'm like, how is this the fight? But without that being the heart of our literacy classrooms, it's like, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you're wrong. Maybe we're all just totally misguided. But I can't see it going very well, right? Because it's pretty hard to motivate a group of eighth graders that you and I have encountered together solely on the basis of you have to answer questions one through five, right? Like it's hard to get to kids if it's just about the lesson plan and the textbook and the short story excerpt that they don't care about. No, it's not and it. No. And unfortunately, I have like my own children in schools where they're experiencing that, where they don't read a whole yeah. book. You know, they don't read a book the entire year. Um, yeah, it's really it's really heartbreaking. Not to mention Except that the if fact anyone knows anything about your parenting, Naval, all they do is read when they're with you because you are one of the best parents I know. So, you know, yes, yes. I'm sorry for your kids classmates, although your children are fine. That's not true. I've lost your children are incredible. Ones. I've lost them to TikTok um, and the Nintendo. Okay, so your other question was, oh, sorry, your other question was question number four, which said, this is going to be hard to come up with on the spot, but I believe in you. Okay, great. If you had a motto for teaching right now in our current circumstances, what would it be? This is not going to be hard to come if up with If you need time to spot. think, I can share. No, it's not? I well, I, you have a motto? No, I mean, I, I could use a, a variety of different mottos that have come to my mind already. <laughs> would you like me to give you one? I can give Fair. you one. I would. I would. Yes. Yes. You could give me okay. all of them if you want. I mean, this is a I'm real loose podcast. I don't know if you've noticed. It's not a really tight ship here <laughs> in, in my dining room. So say as many as you want. Um, I'm going to give you one that I've been thinking about a lot, which is um, the universe does not make mistakes. 
Um, and it's like the second, mm. it's the second philosophical um, kind of pillar of yoga, which is, I think it's called Sankocha, yep. um, which is like, you are exactly where you're meant to be at any given moment. I say mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. not specifically for the curricular methodology wars that we're fighting right now, but for where teachers might feel like they are in their practice across time in different spaces where they may or may not have support in their communities, in their schools with admin or otherwise, like you keep fighting the good fight, but recognize and know that like you are where you're supposed to be. Like you are learning something in those fights. You are learning something yeah. in the times that you close the door and, and uh, operate what, in what is the locus of your control. You like all of these experiences shape the educator that you are and that you will become and that you continue to be for your kids. And so I think like, a, a, you know, this is this is life work. You know that like when we talk, it's about life and it's about educating at the same time. <laughs> um, like if you I, having four kids was a lesson in, in relinquishing control in some ways and not like fighting in a way <laughs> that feels like you are constantly in conflict with yourself. Um, and so while it's not necessarily a motto for education alone, I think that like have some faith that if you continue to put the kids in front of you and the kids best interests in mind, regardless of the curriculum that you're mandated to teach, regardless of how tough different years are, you are where you're supposed to be. Yeah. How's that one? I love that. I love that one. You know, it's funny is the one I was going to say, I haven't shared mine in any of these conversations yet, but the one that I was thinking about when I thought about this question is similar. It's uh, if you doubt, you can wonder. Hmm. Right. If that like, if you're in a place of doubt, Doubt is just the flip side of wondering and dreaming and hoping, right? And like, I can tend towards doubt. I can tend towards, I always like the existentialists as philosophers because they're kind of like, everything's meaningless. And that means that you get to make your own meaning. How wonderful, mm. right? Like there is no inherent meaning and therefore you get to find the meaning for yourself, which is sort of similar to, right? To that, like wherever you are, there's lessons being learned there. There's life being lived. There's a beautiful struggle to be had, right? And they're the same kind of. I was going to say they're the same kind they're of. The same kind of. They're the same right? kind of. Also, like if you doubt, you can wonder. The universe doesn't make mistakes. You can't reimagine, you know, negative is, that's right. It's, it's never, yeah. it's never really negative. It will, you know, you're, you are where you're meant to be. You are where you're um, meant to be. The universe that, doesn't make mistakes. I have that sort of tattooed on my arm. Um, it says the light of the beloved shines only now, which could have been another motto, but it's the idea. And it's not the beloved as in a religious figure, but it's the idea that right now is right now. And you are where you are meant to be. I mean, it is, this is the moment that you have. Yeah. So if you have a feeling, if you have a doubt, if you have a wondering, if you have a, you know, a challenge, a student, a, a administrator, it's okay. This is like my, my yeah. really good psychologist friend. She's just like, babies cry. <laughs> so babies are going to cry. It's the same. I mean, it's the same idea. It's like, you're here right now. Um, it seems simple, but I actually yeah. think it's very hard in practice. Um, and, and so that's why it's a good mantra. It's impossible it's in practice, right? It's impossible. It's what, yeah, it's a lifelong goal, right? To be able to do that. And like, I also feel like when I've tried to avoid feeling the negative feelings, the struggle, the doubt, the, oh no, what if this is a mistake, all this kind of stuff. When I've tried to avoid those feelings, I've stopped growing, right? As a person, as an educator, as a parent, as a partner, as a friend, because I'm trying to make things comfortable and I'm trying to escape discomfort. But like, I've had mentors who've said, like, pain is sort of the touchstone of spiritual growth, right? That like, you can't really grow into something different without pain and discomfort. 
Now, sometimes in education, I feel like enough. Do you know what I mean? Have we grown enough? Like, I feel like, okay, like now let's talk about, you know, ease and reward and being taken care of and all that good stuff. But there is something there, right? Of like leaning into that, leaning into the tough parts of this gig that we find ourselves in. Not to mention the fact that we have to be willing to be uncomfortable in front of our students. Like if we show ourselves as these perfect mentors that are, you know, infallible, it, that's super yeah. inaccurate. And unfortunately, like our kids cannot yeah. grow up with the idea that we, you know, that's why I love to say things like, I'm not sure. And I can think about that alongside you, mm -hmm. or I really don't know. Can you give me yep. two days to research that and figure it out? Like those kinds of phrases were not said to us when we were growing up by maybe our adults or our mm -hmm. educators. Right. Um, and so I love nuanced and important representations of, of adults being imperfect for our kids including us. <laughs> I love that. And actually to tie it back to my book for a second. <laughs> um, also there, like I try to do a lot of my work now, I feel like if I were to characterize my work, it's I want to demonstrate imperfection as much as possible to the teachers I work with, to the kids I work with, that like I think really we are in so much of a zone right now of the perfect being the enemy of the good where like I have to have the perfect slide and the perfect activity and the perfect thing. And like literacy is not like that. Life's not like that. Right. So like all the work that's in my book is rough draft work that I've done just quickly or a kid did quickly. Do you know what I mean? It's to have it be as authentic as possible because like the authentic mess is great. Like I love Sorry. workshop because I love being able to demonstrate in front of kids, right. To say like, I'm going to write in front of you. It's not a pre done piece. I'm just going to get in there and try to figure it out. And like that imperfection, I feel like, especially now kids resonate so much more strongly with than some perfect glitzy thing. Right. We need that. And teachers need that book as a mentor for that, because I think teachers gravitate towards perfection sometimes, you know, Tom Newkirk's, uh, Tom Newkirk's book, Embarrassment, you know, that, I do that know book, that Embarrassment. Book. Have you read I that? Do. Yeah, of that book, because there's so much of education. Like, I think he's really right on that, like a huge piece of people's experience in schools is dealing with being embarrassed. That's how in front of your kids feel. in front of each other Someone comes in your room and watches you. Right. It's just it's a lot of eyes on you all the time to you're always public on some level. Interesting. Interesting. And families feel that, too. I think families feel the embarrassment also mm -hmm. of how they show up in schools you know, the embarrassment of how they might look. Yeah. There's all kinds of, you know, biases with, with teachers in it, inadvertently about how families should look, sound, or act. That There's a lot of that. Your book is so needed. That was yours. All right, five, number five. This is a good one. Why do you think it still matters to teach students to read, to read more powerfully and independently? I actually just like, had the chance, cares, to... right? Like I've been thinking about this a lot. I'm like, what is even going on? I feel like reading's being under threat. I'm like, I've devoted my career to reading. And so I'm spending a lot of time this year just being like, why does it matter? Why do I care about it? Am I wrong? Right? Like, what's the thing about it that I think is worth fighting for? I mean, I had the opportunity to think through this alongside Jasmine Warga this week because we are teaching a highlights course um, for families and for educators and for storytellers. I'm super excited about it. But we were thinking about how, uh, how important reading is for writing and how important reading is for making sense of the world and how us as like really avid readers, like how we've learned so much about how to teach kids as a result of our own habits in reading, for example. I'm having a really tough time reading the past, you know, six to nine months. <laughs> really tough. Like, I, this is like an aberration for me and I cannot get through a book. Like, um, and so I'm halfway through a bunch of fiction books. I am trying different nonfiction and I'm leaving them. I'm like abandoning books. I'm trying audio books. Guess what? That's like an important, that's important info for me to know as a teacher. But I think more than anything, kids who read widely and know their own personal relationship with books do better at life at problem solving 
they do better at if they are in a slump, if they need to reach towards empathy, if they need to make a connection for a human, like there are, there are examples and characters that we have connected to. There's like a boatload of research to talk about how fiction reading builds empathy in the brain. Um, you know, I just, I will never not be an advocate for reading widely, reading in very personal ways, being able to like make the decisions that we want to make about which book we want to read and when and why, because like, that's how I am as an adult. And I am not an adult who watches TV and watches film. Like, I just don't know how I'm, I'm not one who can like fall into the story and, and get stuck there because my mind wanders, but books do that for me. So it's also my only escape. And so that's important for me to know as a, yep. about myself. And there might be some children like that. You know, I know, I know kids who like my, <laughs> some of my friends, some of my kids' friends come over and they like, they don't watch TV because they like are, they are, they can't focus on the TV. They're in, uninterested in a movie, unlike my children, you know, but like that might be a child who could fall in love with reading, who could find their escape in the future in a silly romance in a, uh, a uh, hilarious graphic novel. Um, I just, and I, I think that, I think that the problem solving piece is real, that if you understand yourself as a reader, you can like navigate relationships and situations differently because you've experienced all of these in the pages of a book. I don't know. That's right. Well, if you don't have those if you don't have those connections in your real life, right, which a lot of kids don't, like a lot of kids aren't talking intimately and deeply with lots of people around them about their secret thoughts and desires. Do you know what I mean? I didn't talk like that very much with people in my life until I got older. And like, where else are you going to get that insight that like you're not alone and that humanity has a lot of things in common, regardless of where you're from, and also some huge differences that you need to learn about. And like, where else are you going to learn that, right? Not really probably from TV and movies, even though I'm interested in this because I do like media. I like TV and movies and all that. And uh, I wonder sometimes, again, I challenge myself to be like, why does reading matter? Do you know what I mean? If you can like also watch someone's experience on screens, why does it matter that you're reading? But there's something so much more meditative about it, right? And, and personal about reading because you only really have like the author's words. You don't have like a team of people showing you exactly what you should think and feel and look at and all that, right? It's like, you really have to do a lot of that work yourself, which is what kids and people sometimes don't like about reading is that you have to engage and be present and pay attention and do all that. But like, how much have we lost that these last few years in screens and pandemic and attention and all this stuff? We need it desperately, even if it's just 15 minutes to be able to sit and be quiet and focus on something. I actually like feel myself falling when I am reading something that I love. I like feel myself like relaxing and falling into the book in such, a, you know, the writers of fiction who are such observers of humanity, I think that's the most that's the, the part that I can never let go of that I want like every student and every child to have the experience with is like, look at what keen observers they are. And you too could be that kind of keen observer in your writing and in your, I mean, there's, I mean, writers always talk about how reading is part of the writing process. Like you cannot separate the two, you know, like Pam Allen says, reading is breathing in and writing is breathing out. Um, I think that there's, there's, I will, yeah, we will never stop fighting that fight, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> we'll never stop fighting that fight, even with myself, since I also am in a reading slump. <laughs> um, I love, I can't remember right now. Can you tell me the name of the series you're doing with the authors? It's incredible. Oh, I love it so much. The Kid Lit, Nourishing Kid Lit with Caregivers series. Um, I'm interviewing these Kid Lit writers that I mention in my book specifically through the lens of like, if it was a family listening to you, what would you hope for your book? What kinds of conversations mm -hmm. did you hope would spring from this? It could also be educators listening. Um, I've gotten a ton of lovely feedback for people saying, I, I, please don't stop. Please keep interviewing. <laughs> yeah. So that's fun. They're beautiful conversations. Yeah. And if so you know people that, who've heard yeah. Naval, please if you notice, they're all very emotional because they reached to the heart of like 
what literacy is about. They're all very much about the people who have shaped us and about ancestors. And I mean, I think three of them, we cry in them. Um, so yeah, because that's what literacy teaching is. And that's what you taught me, my friend. So thank you for having me. Well, that's what you embody, Naval, all the time, as I go back to my introduction of you. So anyone who's interested in more of Naval, which you should be, you should check out Nourishing Caregiver Collaborations and the Kidwit series um, is incredible. Uh, Naval, thank you for your work and for who you are. Thank you. I can't wait to get my hands on your book. <laughs>